Welcome back to the School of Muscle. Today, we have on Dr. Emily Manugian, and she is a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute. She's the head of the human studies at a lab with a focus of understanding timing of behaviors such as eating, light exposure, activity, and sleep, and how that relates to health. And in this podcast episode, we discuss circadian rhythms, how that might affect insulin sensitivity and how that could be applied to athletes. We we talk about how light exposure affects these things. We talk about social jet lag and if it's a bad idea to eat protein right before bed. We discuss all these things in this episode and I can't wait for you to listen to it. So without further ado, here's Dr. Emily Manugian. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So kind of the first place that I think would be a good place to start to kind of get everybody on the same page here is just to kind of define what we're talking about when we're saying biological rhythms, circadian rhythms, and things like that. Yeah, so biological rhythms and specifically circadian rhythms um, are really just 24-hour oscillations in the day. So circadian literally is Latin for about a day, um, and it's the most common kind of biological rhythm that we're, you know, we interact with on a daily basis. Um, and when we talk about biological rhythms, we're really just saying these are rhythms that um, are happening within our physiology and are actually come from within our body. So even if you were in a constant environment, your body would still have these approximate 24-hour rhythms in pretty much everything from behavior like sleep-wake cycles, even your mood and cognitive abilities are regulating with a 24-hour day. Think about physiology, pretty much anything you'd get tested at a doctor's office has a rhythm. So if you're looking at body temperature or heart rate or blood pressure, and even a wide variety of blood tests, you know, your hormones are released at certain times of day. So you have these oscillating levels. And then at an individual cell level, um, it's actually your DNA has these biological clocks that create this pattern at the cell level. And then it kind of leads up into this, uh, you know, higher level uh, rhythms that we're able to kind of be aware of ourselves. Um, And so we're talking about this, it's kind of a little bit of everything. It's kind of everything that you are has this pattern to keep everything in the right place at the right time. And it comes from within and it has about a 24 hour pattern. Wow. So basically it, it's more than just a few things. It's basically everything it kind of has this rhythm that's fluctuating throughout the day. <laughs> yeah. Most things have rhythms. Um, and you don't notice them all the time. Um, but it's a lot of just kind of you don't notice them because they're where they're supposed to be. You know, it's like, right. You don't notice the squeaky wheel until it starts squeaking. Right. Uh, Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So kind of, that kind of gives us a nice broad foundation here. So what are some consequences of maybe having kind of some, I don't know if distorted is the right word, but maybe some disrupted circadian rhythms. Yeah. So as I said, all these rhythms come from within, but, um, the body is meant to take in cues from the environment to kind of coordinate your body with its external environment. And so the two biggest cues are light and food. Light's actually going to talk to this master pacemaker in your brain that kind of controls all the other clocks, uh, downstream and food's going to directly change the nutrient availability to all of your cells. And that's going to change a lot of different cellular processes. Um, and it also wakes up your digestive system. You know, if you want to keep the food down, your body's got to do something with it. Um, and so it's activating that. Um, when you give your body cues at the wrong time of day, say you get a lot of really bright light late at night, you know, you're telling the clock in your brain, it's not night anymore. It's, it's daytime. You should be awake. And this can have downstream effects for compromising sleep ability, um, and kind of disrupting these patterns of the, you know, kind of the clocks that are controlled in your brain that you're, uh, your master pacemaker is going to talk to you directly. And when you eat at the wrong time of day, there's a few different things that can happen. One, it's an, it's an arousing cue. So same thing, you can kind of throw off your sleep ability. So even if you fall asleep, you're probably not getting as good of a sleep. Um, it's, it's a conflicting cue to your body overall, but more directly, you're also going to be changing the way that your body regulates glucose. You're going to be potentially stopping the ability for your digestive system to kind of rest and repair overnight. Um, and you're going to be kind of telling it that, again, it's a different time of day. This is time when food is available. And so when we think of things like insulin sensitivity, um, I was just reading a paper before we talked actually about um, how, you know, even four days of shift work schedule can actually compromise insulin sensitivity because your body isn't able to predict it. And I think 
that's one of the things that I think of a lot when we're talking about circadian rhythms is it's an anticipatory system. You're setting up this kind of schedule. It has this kind of timeline of what it thinks is going to happen. You can kind of modify it with these cues from the environment to make it sync. But when we throw these really kind of erratic cues or really disruptive cues of the body, it's a big challenge. It can't anticipate what it needs. It has to kind of have this, you know, after the fact response. Um, mm-hmm. And it can really disrupt a lot of systems. Gotcha. And is there like certain diseases that might result from having disrupted cues and things like that? Yeah. So we actually started making a list of uh, diseases that are associated with circadian disruption. We have a strong list of over a hundred different diseases. And we actually went to a conference and had this live interactive poster where it was like, come and put up a disease that you know is related. And it filled in even more. Um, Honestly, you know, there are diseases that are, you know, most of these diseases aren't caused by circadian disruption. Mm -hmm. It's more that circadian disruption is going to weaken the system and is more likely to kind of make you vulnerable to those diseases. So different people will be more sensitive to different things. If you, you know, cardiovascular disease runs in your family and you're heavily circadianly disrupted, I would guess that you're going to have, be more prone to high blood pressure, poor cholesterol, those types of things. And you're going to increase your risk for that disease. Um, there are other diseases that we think, you know, regardless of your history, it's going to exacerbate it or make it much more challenging. Things like type two diabetes, um, and metabolic syndrome, which is really a combination kind of, of, of pre-diabetes and cardiovascular disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we think those are probably the first target. I think also going along with sleep, if you're very circadianly disrupted, even if you're getting some sleep, you're probably not getting the proper sleep. And sleep alone is tied to a lot of different types of repair mechanisms. Um, And because it's such an integrated system, it can be difficult to tease it all apart and say, well, what role did sleep have versus the circadian pattern? And there's some cool studies to look at that. Um, But at the same time, you know, when you're looking at someone in the real world and you're just saying, what did this circadian disruption do to you? I think of it as it's really making you a much weaker version of yourself. And if you can optimize those rhythms, you become a much more, you know, much more uh, stronger kind of more vigilant version. Um, and so hopefully you can prevent that onset of disease that you're predisposed to and all those kinds of things. So depending on what you look at, it could be almost anything, which I know is a, right. you know, kind of everything answer, but it's, it's kind of a, one of the core systems of how your body regulates itself. So it's involved in everything. So anything is kind of up to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, it might not necessarily have a direct effect, but that indirect effect of, you know, throwing off your sleep, just that alone could throw off so many more things. So I think that's, I think that's pretty cool there. And well, I mean, not, not cool if you have this (laughs) disruption, but it's an interesting topic anyways. And so the kind of the two main regulatory things that you think are light and food. So I think let's first touch on light. What what kind of things are we are we looking for throughout our day to kind of optimize our, our light cues so we don't disrupt our circadian rhythms? Yeah, so honestly, when it comes down to it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, your body is, is looking for bright light. And when I say bright light, I'm usually talking about natural sunlight. This is like over a, a thousand lux. And that's a lot brighter than what you would normally get indoors in an office. Um, and so your body's looking for those cues in the morning to say this is, you know, the morning that we expect that it's going to be. So getting a ton of bright light in the first half of your day is important. You know, this could be as simple as like, you know, if the only light you're going to see on your commute is on your commute, then like, you know, maybe not wear sunglasses as long as it feels safe. You know, if the sun's directly in your eyes, obviously please wear sunglasses. Um, But if it's indirect, you know, get as much bright light as you can. Or a lot of people just say, you know, open your windows when you wake up, you know, like, you should have a dark room to sleep well, but when you wake up, open those blinds, get that natural sunlight in, try to get exposed within the first 30 minutes of when you wake up. And that can be kind of a reaffirming cue to your body that this is when you're supposed to be awake. And that can be really helpful. And then it's kind of the inverse as your day goes on. So as the sun naturally is going to set, you know, you should also be kind of dimming your lights. Um, and this can be tricky depending on your schedule and your work and, you know, when you're at work and all these kinds of things. But if possible, Um, it's kind of dim that bright light as you, as your day kind of, you know, kind of comes to an end. So, um, don't be looking at, you know, crazy, don't turn every light on that you can just because you can, um, you'd be surprised you get used to it very quickly. Not to say you shouldn't use any light, but you know, get home, cook with lots of light so you can see, (laughs) don't Mm -hmm. burn yourself (laughs) and things. But you know, after dinner, like 
turn some lights off. Or if you have dimmers, you can dim the lights a little bit. Um, and then the other big thing is that blue light, um, which is common in all screens, really, um, is going to directly suppress melatonin more than any other wavelength of light. And melatonin is really important for you to be able to fall asleep. Um, it's only secreted kind of in the dark, and so light suppresses it directly. Um, and so if you're looking at a bright screen right before you go to bed, uh, this could be a problem for trying to help you fall asleep. Mm. Luckily, people are probably getting familiar with more and more phones, especially, um, but also tablets are coming with these uh, kind of light filters at night. Um, I know that a phone I got like a year ago, it, it now has like it automatically just it links with sunset yeah. and then, you know, puts a blue light filter on. Um, and that's really helpful because it's things you don't even really notice or care about, but they can make a big difference for you. So. It's really just getting a lot of bright light in the morning to tell your body it's time to wake up and then trying to avoid that bright light later in the day um, and, and keep it dimmer so it, you know, your body does know it's kind of time to settle in. Right. And I think that that kind of makes intuitive sense. Like when it's light outside, try to get some light and when it's dark outside, maybe avoid the light a little bit. But like for yeah. me, <laughs> yeah. And for, for me, I... It's it's winter break here, so I just went went home for a few days over Christmas break, and my dad's got like every single light on in the house. He's got the TV on. I'm like, Dad, come on, we're trying to sleep here. But, uh, anyways, do you think that like yeah. wearing like blue light glasses, like the little orange filters, are those yeah. like efficacious, or how, how are those working there? I think that's a great question. Um, I think they can be. I think those are going to be the most effective for. So people with migraines um, that are very sensitive to bright light at night, um, I think those are are likely going to be very helpful for them. Um, Studies still need to be done to really flush out if the blue lights are going to help with, you know, kind of, you know, any functional difference um, for kind of average people um, that maybe wouldn't be overly disrupted. And I don't know how much it's going to help over, you know, if you're already able to turn a few lights off, not that you should be walking around in the dark, but just like, you don't need every light on, you know? Um, I'm not sure what the answer is going to be. I think they can be very helpful if you are in a home or a place where there are going to be a ton of lights. Yeah. That might be helpful for you. Or like, you know, the, the phones and tablets are putting blue light filters on, but TVs aren't. So, you know, that's something you can do rather than putting a permanent blue light filter over your TV and making it orange constantly. Um, so I think those can definitely be helpful and just, you know, you hear kind of anecdotal stories from people that have been using these filters, um, that have really helped them with migraines and things like that when they have the sensitivity. Cause that also goes through the same actual, uh, specific cells that are in training your clock. Um, we think that's also involved in that. So, um, I think they can be really helpful for people. Um, but I think the jury is a little bit out still on if everyone should be doing it or if it's really maybe something you should be looking into if you you know you're sensitive. Right. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that for the glasses anyways, they have a pretty good like cost to benefit ratio to where if they help a little bit, they're they're pretty yeah. cheap and easy and they don't cost a whole lot. So it's not like you're spending like hundreds and hundreds of dollars on them. So yeah. I kind of see why not, thing. you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that kind of should give a pretty good rundown of how someone can kind of optimize light. So now let's kind of transition over to food. So Mm -hmm. what kind of things should people be considering when thinking about how to set up their food, their food timing throughout the day to kind of optimize their circadian rhythms and things like that? Yeah. So just like light food's a cue to tell your body it's, it's time to be awake. Um, but it also is this, you know, you're regulating the nutrient availability in your body. Um, and so I like to think of it, it should be a balance of you take food in while you're active, your body uses it, it might store a little, and then you should stop eating, let your digestive system rest, let your body tap into the stores that it already has. That's what fat is. You know, even if you're extremely lean and healthy, we do have some fat, your body's used to regulating Mm -hmm. this. Um, if you're constantly eating, you're never going to tap into those stores because it already has things available. It's like, why would you you know, go to the bank to take out money if you've, if your wallet's already full of cash. Um, so you kind of got to keep that in mind. Um, and as far as what to do, so this, our research on when to eat and the duration of eating and all that kind of stuff started with rodent studies that, um, really kind of took this interesting look at this kind of basic model of what's called diet induced obesity, which is basically if you feed rodents a high fat, high sugar diet, they become obese. 
That's not surprising. It was a standard for this is what you do so you can model these types of diseases. What's interesting was that um, both our labs and other labs as well noticed that they change the pattern of when they eat when they're on this high-fat diet. So mm-hmm. rodents that are, you know, mice that are nocturnal usually eat and are active at night and they mainly sleep and don't really eat much during the day. Um, but when you put them on this high-fat, high-sugar diets, they change that and they kind of spread their food throughout the day. So they're not getting the same kind of consolidated eating or sleep. So the very simple experiment was to say, okay, what if we only let you have access to the same high fat diet, but only for 12 hours a day when your lights are off, when your lights are on, you're in a clean cage that has no food access. You can have water whenever you want, but no food. And they did this and those animals don't gain weight. They eat the same exact number of calories. It's a high fat Hmm. diet. And they don't gain weight. And so calories were matched and everything there? Calories were matched. This is why, huh. um, and they tested this originally with the 12-hour eating interval, and they went all the way down to 8-hour eating intervals where they only had access to food for 8 hours. They didn't go shorter than that because once you got less than 8, they couldn't eat the same number of calories, and that would have been right. a confounding effect. Um, and so, you know, there are all these benefits that have been, you know, replicated many times, you know, giving, getting them fed on eating erratically, putting them on a schedule, watching them lose weight, become healthier, you know, and it's not just weight. They're seeing fatty liver disease goes away or just isn't produced depending on how you do it. Um, and so that was really exciting. And so the question is, okay, well, what about humans? First part was when do humans actually eat because really has not been documented by nutritionists as much. It's more like, you know, calories and the foods and the macronutrients, which are all extremely important. I'm not saying they aren't, but I Mm -hmm. think the timing of food also is. And so we really didn't have an idea. So our lab uh, created a smartphone app called My Circadian Clock. Um, And we just started with some locals in San Diego just to say, when do people eat? And when we did that, um, we found that the average eating interval was about 15 hours a day. And you're only not eating for like nine hours. And if you're sleeping for the seven to nine hours, which are recommended, you're pretty much eating constantly. (laughs) Um, And based on the rodent studies, we think you need really a minimum minimum of, of 12 hours of rest okay. um, where you're not eating. Um, and again, seven to nine of those hours should be, you should be asleep anyway. <laughs> so yeah. you're really only talking about three or four hours where, you know, you're awake and not eating. Um, additionally, we know that food can be a stimulant. So we think that, you know, a lot of that time should probably be when you're not eating should be before you go to sleep. So you, we probably want a three or four hour buffer of not eating before you go to sleep. Um, and once you do that, if you say four hour buffer, you sleep for eight hours, that's 12 hours right there. You could even start as soon as you wake up. Um, and most of our studies were examining an eight, uh, 10 hour eating window as an, as potentially an ideal target that does also allow for a little bit of wiggle room, occasional little teats, you know, you end up at 10 and a half hours is usually what people end up with. Yeah. I think that's fine. Um, and so the way that we go about it is we let people pick the eating window that works for them. Everyone has a different schedule. Um, I don't think there's, you know, it's not like 7 a.m. is correct for everyone. That is not the way to do it. Yeah. It's relative to you and your schedule and your body. So, and people have different preferences. You know, it's got to be something that you're able to stick to because this isn't a diet that you do for a couple months and then you're done. This is yep. an important part of lifestyle. So it needs to be something that you're comfortable with doing, um, that you can fit all your social requirements into. If you know you need to eat dinner with your family when you get home, and that's a requirement. You need to make sure that's within your eating window or it's yeah. going to make life really hard and not feasible. Um, so when I'm talking to people, I say, okay, pick a 10 hour interval that works for you. First, look at any of the things that are requirements like a dinner. And actually that's my deciding factor. So I can get home and have dinner with my husband. Then I know, okay, I kind of count back from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also make sure I have my kind of buffer before I go to bed. So usually that works out to being awake for an hour or two in the morning where you're only having water before you have breakfast and then having, you know, a a three or four hour buffer before you go to bed. And that usually works out for people to be about 10 hours. Um, But some people try shorter. That's fine, too. Uh, I think 10 hours is a great um, target to get to. And for anyone who hasn't done this at all, I, I usually recommend first saying find out what your eating interval currently is. You can download our app and use it. It's free. You can do that yourself. Um, but you could also just try to take note of it. You know, what's the first thing you eat, last thing you eat? Do that for a week or two and kind of see what that interval is. If you're eating mm-hmm. over 15, 16 hours, I don't know if you want to jump to 10. Go to like 12 or 13, 
get used to it a little, then kind of find your way down. Um, the nice thing is once you've been on it for a few weeks, um, it's an anticipatory system. So your appetite actually kind of changes that hunger that you have, um, at night will go away because once your body gets used to not eating, then you won't be, feel hungry. So it actually, if you stick to it for, you know, a few weeks, your, your body kind of helps you stick to it. Um, and then it really isn't much of an issue, but it all kind of comes down to what you can do. We currently are recommending a 10 hour eating window, but even switching to a 12 hour eating window, which might be more realistic for some people on difficult schedules, um, I think is kind of a great first step. Gotcha. So basically to kind of try to kind of sum that up a little bit. So maybe, (laughs) maybe try to get it down to maybe a 10 to 12 hour window and make sure that you have about three hours before bed. Does that sound about right? Yep. Gotcha. And does it now in the like lifting circles, a lot of people want to really maximize that muscle protein synthetic response from protein kind of throughout the day. And Mm -hmm. it's very common for people to have a meal of protein kind of right before bed. So do you think that it matters on like the type of food that you have before bed? Like, do you think that if you just have like 30 grams of protein, that might be a little bit different than having a a full blown meal or what are kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah. So these get tricky. Um, I think, you know, there's no one thing ever that works for everyone in every scenario. Yeah. You know, that's just not true. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what we kind of laid out just a second ago is kind of the general rule for most people. Athletes get interesting because they're burning calories at a different rate. They're going to burn through things a lot faster. You know, if you're doing a really intensive workout, um, you know, and it's late at night, you're kind of yeah. getting into a fasted state a lot faster than someone who's just sitting around watching TV or, yeah. you know, doing work on a computer or something like that. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Mm-hmm. One thing I would say is, um, you're absolutely right. The type of food's going to matter. So if you're having straight protein with like, you know, very little sugar in it, you know, it's like not added sugar, but just natural sugars. It's very little, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to alter your glucose response the same way, right? Your body still has to digest it, but maybe you're not weakening your system to this glucose regulation still could be a conflicting kind of timing cue. Um, but that's something to consider. Um, so there are this, um, like Walter Longo has done some work on these fasting mimicking diets where, um, even when, you know, rather than just having only water that you could kind of trick your body in some ways to just do these really kind of high protein lean kind of things, um, which would, I think, I don't know, it hasn't been directly tested yet, so I can't say for sure. I'm sure it's going to have some effects. It's not as clean as just saying water only, but Mm -hmm. I do think that would probably be beneficial, more beneficial than a full blown meal with a lot of carbs late at night. I think that's going to be hard on you. Um, the other thing to think about is when these exercises are happening, your muscles are actually have different capabilities at different times of day. So you're faster at some times of day, you're actually stronger at other times of day, your muscles have rhythms too. Um, and so that's one thing to keep in mind, but also that if you're doing really strenuous exercise late at night, that itself is a disrupting cue. Mm -hmm. You know, we say light and food are the two biggest and I think they're the biggest, but physical activity, social interactment, you know, if you have a big fight with a significant other, that's going to throw things off too. You know, or your in-laws come over at one in the morning, things are going to be weird. Right. Um, so these are all kind of things you could think about, but I think especially for athletes, they should consider how their workouts are really also a really big cue to their body. And if they're doing a really strenuous workout late at night, that itself is a disrupting cue. And so if they're able to kind of fit workouts more in, um, kind of their natural day when they, you know, not towards the end of their night and they can eat around those times. I think that's likely the most beneficial thing. Um, but really working with athletes and trying to kind of optimize this understanding of the importance of time when you eat to really optimize, um, you know, kind of their goals and what they're trying to do to build muscle and be healthy, I think is still a little bit unclear and we can take some kind of notes to say, you know, limit your eating window to what you can, But I think in those cases, um, we do see these um, situations where it may make more sense for them to have, you know, more like a 12 hour eating interval. Um, Mm -hmm. And this question of should you eat a lot of protein right before bed? I don't have a concrete answer to say that's wrong. Um, I have doubts about it. I'm a little skeptical. (laughs) I think, you know, try to have it a little bit earlier and let your body try to rest while you sleep um, because it's still going to be an arousing cue to your brain to tell it it's awake. And so, 
um, you know, to gain muscle and build muscle, you need to get rest as well. And so if you're compromising sleep, that would be a concern. Um, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done in that realm to say, this is absolutely the best way to do it. Yep, for sure. As with a lot of things, it's hard to just have a blanket statement for everything, you know? (laughs) And I think that's, it's really important to consider like, there's more with lifting weights and stuff. There's more than just muscle protein synthesis. Like if you're sacrificing sleep for that pre-bed meal, right. then you're, it's probably not a, the, a worthy trade-off there, you know? So yeah. I, think, I think that that makes a lot of sense there. And kind of the, the next question that I have is that some people find that, I mean, this could go back to some people are individuals and things don't work for everybody, but some people will anecdotally say that they have a a bigger meal before bed and it just kind of knocks them out. So my kind of question is, is can you have like a bigger meal, fall asleep and not really realize that you're throwing off like sleep quality and things like that? Or what do you think might be going on there? Yes, that absolutely can happen. So, um, very similar to alcohol as well. Alcohol can make you sleepy, but we know that it's going to be altering your brain while you're asleep. Um, and there are some, there's some nice research done on this, you know, food and drink can make you tired. That doesn't mean you're getting a good quality of sleep. You're getting a kind of, uh, modified version of it. Um, this can also be kind of confounded with, you know, sleep is an interesting thing. It tries to catch up when you get behind. So if you're sleep deprived, you know, say you, um, stayed up all night studying or you, you know, were jet lagged or whatever, and you don't get enough sleep that next night, you're going to get a good quality sleep because your body is just like, it shuts down. You know, you get way more deep sleep and that one night of sleep will look like a very healthy sleeper. Um, however, when you throw food at it and you do all these other things, your brain can't rest properly. So you actually will usually stay in lighter realms of sleep. You might be unconscious, but you're not getting that same type of rest. And if you look at especially the digestive system, if there's food in your system or there's something that has to be broken down, you know, that digestive system can no longer repair itself. Um, Sachin frequently likes, I like his metaphor of it's kind of like a highway. You can't fix potholes if there's cars driving on the road. Um, and there is this kind of nightly repair mechanism that happens that, you know, the lining of your intestines and that, which is heavily involved in absorption and acid levels and, you know, all these other things, it's not really going to recover properly if you're constantly putting food down it. Um, and so I think there's a lot of areas where, yeah, it makes sense to have a meal for, you know, X, Y, Z, but we're forgetting about this other long list of consequences that we could have. There's probably some kind of happy medium. Um, maybe you eat two hours before you bed and instead of four, but you know, not immediately before, um, or you eat later in the morning. So your body gets, you know, you just have water in the morning so you can rest. And again, that depends on the person. Some people wake up starving and need to eat or need their coffee. Some people are fine to wait and, you know, really want to eat more at night. I think that's going to kind of come down to the individual what's feasible, but yes, I think you can absolutely eat and be totally unconscious and (laughs) feel good about that, but really actually have a lot of compromised sleep as a result. Okay. Gotcha. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And for me personally, like if, if I eat too close to bedtime, I'll wake up in the middle of the night sweating and I'll, I'll have to go to the bathroom and it really throws me off. So I know a lot of people can probably get pretty stubborn with their pre-bed protein and stuff like that, but I really don't think it's a good idea to sacrifice (laughs) sleep for that meal, even, even for building muscle, let alone health and things like that. Like sleep, big issue there. Sleep is a huge issue. And in all fairness, on the other side of this, there, there's actually a cool paper that came out not long ago showing that the part of your, there's a part of your brain that's involved with both hunger and um, arousal. And that if you're too hungry, basically it will override a sleep cue. So it can be disturbing to be too hungry. That being said, eating within a 10 or 12 hour window shouldn't make you so hungry at night mm-hmm. that you can't sleep. And usually people can get past this pretty quickly, you know, just like fall asleep and you forget about it Um, because hunger also has a rhythm, shocking, you know, so if you stick to it, it kind of falls into it. But um, yeah, it it gets tricky with athletes. It really does because Mm -hmm. their energy utilization is quite different. Um, Right. So I I could see where there's going to be more exceptions there than for kind of 
the average Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that that's really interesting. You say that on like your hunger cues can kind of mess up your sleep cues because I know that just kind of anecdotally, like in, in the more bodybuilding or physique circles, when people are dieting and they've been in a calorie deficit deficit for a while and their hunger, hunger levels are more naturally high. They tend to find that if they do kind of have a meal a little bit closer to bed, it kind of dissipates that hunger and it actually helps them sleep a little bit better. So could you kind of it see that? Gotcha. So yeah, that kind of makes sense, sense to you. Makes sense. Yeah. And you know, when we're saying eat within a 10 to 12 hour window, I'm not saying to starve yourself, you know, like yeah. you can, I mean, you should absolutely eat, you know, quality, healthy food in reasonable amounts. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like eat within this window and you can eat, you know, horrible food as yeah. much as you want and binge eat. That's not the case. Right. It's more that, you know, when you think about it, if you say, what's a healthy lifestyle, people tend to say, you know, when, what, and how much you eat, sleep, and move, uh, or what and how much. And now we're saying it's also when, you know, it's like right. another component of that health. Um, but yeah, so it's not like we're saying that what, how much you eat and your total calories and stuff like that doesn't matter at all. All Correct. we're saying is of that this, is. <laughs> this timing component matters a little bit too here. Yeah. Cool. And so, if you, regardless of what you do on those other components, we all know diets are hard to stick to. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whatever else you're capable of, adding this timing component should be an added benefit. So even if you're already eating healthy, this should help support your health. If you're eating poorly, this should also help you a lot You know, more. You might see a bigger change because you're introducing this new health component. Um, but it, it should be kind of this additive effect that kind of works synergistically with it. Cool. Cool. So I think we've kind of covered light, covered food a little bit. And kind of the, the next thing I'd like to jump to is kind of like social jet lag. And I know in, in your TED talk, which was really good, by the way, Thank you. <laughs> you, you discuss kind of how if, if you're just off by like a couple hours, like go to bed a couple hours in regular, it can really throw you off for maybe even days. So could, could you kind of speak to kind of what, what might be your rule of thumb with social jet lag and things like that? Yeah. So honestly, uh, our society has kind of made things difficult for a lot of us. Um, we all have what we call a chronotype, which is kind of our relationship with the environment. Some of us are early people. Some of us are late people. Um, and unfortunately throughout your life, you kind of have set times where you have to be somewhere. Um, and I think you see this most commonly in high school students, um, and college students where they may have, especially high school where they have these very early start times. Mm -hmm. Um, and their bodies are in kind of their latest phase where they want to stay up later and wake up later. Like that's just what their body wants to do. It's not the being lazy. Right. It's a biological fact. Uh, so they're some, some of the best examples, but we see this in adults as well. You know, if, especially with early work hours, or even if you start at nine, which is usually pretty reasonable, long commutes can really make that quite difficult. So the idea of social jet lag is that you're forcing your body to wake up earlier than it wants to wake up on weekdays. And it's actually the weekend where you're seeing this kind of what your body really wants to do, or mm. it doesn't even have to be a weekend whenever you relieve that, um, kind of necessity of being somewhere and seeing what your body would naturally do. So commonly you see it waking up very early on, on weeknight or work weekdays, trying to get to bed earlier on weekdays, having a hard time doing that. So probably being a little sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. And then on weekends, getting this huge recovery sleep followed by staying up much later another recovery sleep, set, you know, trying to get to bed early the next night, but probably not being able to, mm -hmm. getting a really short sleep on Monday, you know, excuse me. And it's a really in that big cycle shift. There. Yeah. And it's really hard to get out of. Um, and some people, it's just very difficult to do. And so we call it social jet lag because it's basically like you're going between coasts. Um, it's the same thing. Your body feels like it's shifting time zones. Mm. Um, and so there are a few ways to deal with it. Um, one, try to get a better schedule if you can. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's usually not the option. Um, but really, it's trying to shift. If you know that you're a late person and it's hard for you to wake up early, I'm not saying don't get your recovery sleep on the weekend because your body needs that recovery sleep. So that's fine. But what you can do is try to use the cues that we talked about. Use light, use food, use activity as a way to try to shift yourself as early as you can, you know, trick your body by using these cues. So you can wake up a little earlier and it's the same things, you know, really get a ton of bright light right when you wake up, try to shift your eating window a little bit earlier. So you are getting like that full four hours, 
you know, really dim those lights at night and then physically get into bed. <laughs> like, you know, like there are things you can try to do because unfortunately, if you just go with how you're feeling that one night, you're going to feel really awake and it's like, cool, I'm fine. I can stay up. And then unfortunately you don't get to sleep in until your body wants to sleep in. So if you stay up as late as your body wants to, you're kind of kicking yourself in the leg because you got to wake up in the morning and your body mm -hmm. doesn't get to decide that. So you can try to use all these cues to shift your body as much as possible. And really, you know, staying consistent with those cues is really helpful. Um, one trick that I found helps me because I am not a morning person and luckily I have a little flexibility in my schedule, but still I'm not a morning person <laughs> is, um, morning exercise can actually be a cue to help your body get used to it. So, um, lucky enough to live in San Diego or we can go swimming kind of all year round and I have to like swimming and there's an outdoor pool at the Y. I'm so from going, the Midwest. So yeah. just, just rub it <laughs> in harder. there a little bit more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> But, you know, or going for a run, whatever. Um, but, you know, getting up and going to a pool and swimming, at first I was like, this is going to be really hard to do before work. I already have a hard time waking up. But that actually was one of the things that helped me the most because I was outside getting natural sunlight for like 35 to 45 minutes while exercising. So my body was being awoken. All my muscles were waking up. I was getting this really bright light. I'd then yeah. eat after, so I didn't have a real early morning start. Yeah. And I would be very alert. And then it also made it so I, my body knew it was like active, bright light, eating, morning. And then the day kind of dimmed down. So I would be tired earlier in the night. Um, and that kind of helped me switch to that. So early morning activity can be a nice trick for some people. Kind of vice versa. Not that you have to work out in the morning, but working out really late at night can make things harder. You know, giving any type of arousal cue at night mm -hmm. can make things trickier. And so... You know, it's very easy to fall into binge watching shows because you are awake. You actually sleep in circadian patterns, have this fun little interaction, but you do get this little burst of energy like near your bedtime, like mm -hmm. just from a circadian thing, um, which evolutionarily supposedly helped us, but currently makes it so we do keep binge watching that yeah. show or we do go get another snack and we feel great. So we're like, it's fine. I'll be, I'll be fine in the morning. It's really not true. So a lot of it's just, you know, trying to override that and use all these cues to support what your the schedule your body should be on rather than conflicting with it. And it's easier said than done. But again, it's because it's this anticipatory system, if you can get on track with it for a few weeks, it gets a lot easier to fall into. Gotcha. So try to use these external cues, light, food, exercise, kind of in unison with whatever schedule that you're kind of required to be at right now and yeah. try to use those cues and try to optimize things as best you can then. Yeah. yeah. And get recovery sleep on weekends if you need it because you need sleep. That being said, don't stay up until three in the morning on a weekend <laughs> and, and hurt yourself that way. Right. So yeah. that trying to keep consistent is, is good. And I think one thing we, we hadn't talked about yet is like, yes, consistency is good. I would say every day you should do these things. That's not, you know, realistic by any stretch of the imagination that uh -huh. every day you're going to do all these things perfect. Um, and even with the time restricted eating, you know, when they did the rodent studies, they actually did one where they only did time restricted eating for five days of the week and two <laughs> days of the week they could eat whenever they wanted. And they still saw most of the benefits. So I think it's kind of like, you know, you shouldn't eat cake every day, but if it's your birthday, eat that cake, you know? So yeah. even like, once a week, if you're going to have to cheat or have that drink late at night, or, you know, there's a social event, go ahead. But as long as most of the time your body's on the schedule, I think you'll get most of the benefit. Um, so again, staying up late because there's, you know, a birthday party or you're having friends over, of course it's fine. Occasionally it just shouldn't be the norm. Um, and realize that the later you stay up on that weekend, you're almost trying to re-entrain your body to be later. And so trying to be yeah. as consistent as possible is, is really helpful. That, that was going to be my very next question. I was going to ask you how, how much it would affect somebody if they have that kind of that social night out or something like that. So it sounds like every once in a while, probably not a huge deal in the grand I, yeah. scheme of things. I think it's fine in moderation. I think one interesting thing, though, is uh, it, it can kind of make you more sensitive to things. So uh, I'm on a 10-hour eating window, as is my husband. And there was a night where we had a friend in town that could only get together for drinks quite late. And I was like, oh, no, this is outside of my eating window it was early on. And uh, I, I was like, what am I going to do? And he's like, well, just have water. And I was like, uh, we're going to get margaritas. I love margaritas. 
that's not going to be possible. And he's like, well, just have like one drink. It's fine. You just cheat today. We got there and I'm about to order. And I realized I genuinely didn't want it. Like I just Mm -hmm. didn't sound good to consume something. So I just had water. Everything was fine. My husband did cheat and (laughs) he only had like one margarita. And he like the next day is like, Oh my God. I'm like almost hung over. <laughs> I'm like tired. He's like, I had one drink and I was like, that's cause your body wasn't ready for it. <laughs> and like, you kind of see these things are like, I've noticed, um, when I've changed time zones, um, for travel, I just got back from a large time zone change. Um, and you notice like my appetite was just really cut. Like it was like, I was barely hungry at all in that new time zone. Cause I was 10 mm-hmm. hours out of phase, you know, when I was supposed to be eating there, my body thought I was supposed to be sleeping. And so I had a very little appetite for days while I was adjusting. Yeah. Um, and so you do kind of notice it, you know, and so you might, that doesn't mean I don't cheat occasionally. I absolutely do. Right. Um, but it's easier to not cheat than you think. Um, your gotcha. body kind of helps with that. And so you might, you know, not want to cheat as much, you know, maybe you have one drink, but not three. <laughs> Something. <laughs> right. So how long did it kind of take you to adjust to your new schedule to where your, your hunger cues and stuff like that was kind of normalized after these time zone changes? Oh, that, okay. So starting originally, I think I got on this, like my appetite really falls off. Um, I think that took like four or five weeks time zone changes. It's more of shifting the clocks. So now that it has a kind of a rhythm and an, an expectation, it's just shifting what it expects. Um, with when we talk about jet lag and shifting your body can ship maybe shift maybe up to an hour a day so a one hour time zone change could take people anywhere from one to three days to adjust to mm. this past one for me was like a 10 hour shift oh, <laughs> um, which was a lot but um it did probably take the better part of a week to kind of get back yeah. on things and then you know then i flew back so i'm still kind of messed up a little bit. <laughs> yeah uh, but, and it's one of those things you kind of get into. Um, and then you're trying to adjust on food. I usually err on the side of not eating unless you're like really hungry. And, um, especially while you're traveling, I think, I think there's tricks to jet lag that you can do that <laughs> makes it a lot easier. You know, don't eat while you're traveling. I think sleep dep- deprivation is actually an amazing tool for shifting to a new time zone mm. and kind of use those things and then use light food and sleep as a way to jump kind of on to your new thing. So eat when they're supposed to eat, you know, forget when you used to eat and try to do it that way. That can help with some things. Um, and different parts of your body shift a little faster than others, which is also Mm -hmm. kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so it can get a little tricky. I, you know, I probably won't be fully synchronized for another five or six days, but right now it's within reason I can function. Well, uh, that's good at least. (laughs) So, so if you do have kind of that, that social jet lag, still a good idea to kind of try to use your external cues, like always to kind of set yourself up for success as much as possible then. Absolutely. I mean, you can think of them as supporting cues that are kind of confirming what your body's already thinking or slightly adjusting the path that it's on. And really, if you're using them in these like reasonable amounts, slight shifts, it's really just a slight modulation what really gets concerning and is this chronic circadian disruption where your body's trying mm-hmm. to stay on a rhythm and the light is giving conflicting cues throughout the day and your eating right. is totally erratic where some days it's super early and some days it's super late and some days it doesn't come and, you know, that's yeah. when your body, you're just like kind of throwing really weird signs at your clocks and it, it can throw mm-hmm. them off chronically. So as much as you can do to support your schedule, support your body's natural rhythms and keep it consistent, um, you know, the better. So if you have a horribly uncircadian day, you know, don't fret about it and say it's over every day is a new day. Um, and trying to just kind of do anything that you can do, um, is is helpful. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So I think that's about all I have there. I'm, I'm interested though. What, what are you kind of working on right now or what are you kind of excited about right now for kind of around this topic? Yeah. So we're now starting to use time restricted eating, um, as a potential intervention for individuals, both with metabolic syndrome, which again is this kind of predisposition to cardiovascular disease and prediabetes. Um, and we're also starting to study firefighters. So we are working with the San Diego Fire Department, who works on 24 hour shifts um, to see if time restricted feeding can help them long term. They start very healthy and they have a very early onset of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Um, and we think this is partially because they're eating around the clock. 
Um, we can't change when they get to sleep, but we can change when their metabolic system gets to rest. Right. And so we're, we're working with them. We're doing year long study with them, which we're really excited wow. about. And we're about first participant is nine months through. So uh, cool. we're working with them. That's exciting. Um, and they've been wonderful to work with. They've been a great group of people. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I know, I mean, we got to go on some 24 hour ride alongs ourselves. It is exhausting. I I'm don't sure. know how they do it. It's amazing that they're able to do this. Um, and so we're really excited to find ways to hopefully, you know, help them be, mm -hmm. feel better and be a healthier version of themselves because they take quite a hit protecting us. So, um, we're really excited about hopefully, you know, this helping, you know, that part of our community that really yeah. needs it. No, that that's awesome. That's incredible. I know just in my previous experience, I've worked some, I've never worked like the night shift, but I've had friends that have worked in the night shift and coworkers and things like that and really, really can take a hit on their health. So that would be awesome if this Very could be hard. something that helps them all out for sure. Yeah. So we're really excited about how that, how that will go. And as a circadian biologist, I think all of us have had very disrupted rhythms because we all study things at night <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's the running joke is we should all just study ourselves, um, <laughs> because we all, we all felt it. And I think that keeps us motivated because it's horrible yeah. and a yeah. huge population of individuals are on these kind of really rough shifts. And so if we can do something as simple and non-invasive and free as change when you're eating to really help people cope with this a lot better. I think that's, that's a really exciting line of work. Yeah. I think that'd be awesome. So where, where can people, if they want to find more about you or more stuff you're doing, is there a place where people can go find that? Yeah. So our website is mycircadianclock.org. Um, and you can read about the team and we put up science blogs and some videos and stuff like that. Um, and then we also, that's where you can, uh, sign up to use the app. It's available on iPhone and Android for free. Um, you do have to read through the informed consent. We will collect your data. We don't share it with anyone. It's all very private. Um, but yeah, you can use the app for free. You can find out what your eating windows are, uh, set goals for yourself, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So that that's where you'd go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast. If you enjoyed it, screenshot it, put it on your story, share this thing around. I know em I haven't seen Emily on very many podcasts, and I definitely think that this is a topic that is worth sharing around to get some discussion about. So if you would do me the favor, share this around. It really does help me out. Make sure to go check out Emily's stuff. Check out my stuff at ryanjsolomon.com, and I will see you in that next episode.